This next session is uh, data mining, excavating for information. And we've got a panel of three people here. We've got Jill Stewart, who is a senior product uh, manager with Abila, responsible for the strategic direction of the enterprise level fundraising product Millennium. Nancy Penner, who is uh, responsible for the management of the Millennium Fund raising soft software data integrations, reporting, and analytics for MD Anderson's development office since 2001. And we also have with us Sean Vincent, who has served as the Director of University Relations Information Services at the University of Puget Sound here in Tacoma, Washington. Please welcome our panel for data mining and excavating for information. Hello. Okay. <laughs> that, uh, I'm Jill Stewart with Abila, and that is uh, the company that now owns Millennium Software, uh, which is used by both of my colleagues here. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about data mining. And I was looking around for a name for this presentation and doing a little reading on data mining on the internet and discovered that if you write something about data mining, you inevitably have to make analogies to physical mining. Uh, and you have to talk about sifting for prospects and mining for gold and chipping away at things. So um, I did that for the title and my little graphic here, but I promise that will be the last reference to uh, actual ore mining in this presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so I think we've already been introduced. We have uh, Nancy Penner from the NBA Newton Cancer Center and Sean Vincent from uh, locally, University of Puget Sound. And uh, in terms of data mining, uh, how many folks in this group or, or your organizations are doing any type of data mining or data analysis currently? Everybody here. Very much everybody <laughs> here. Well, that's great. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it's uh, analysis to extract patterns and finding ways to utilize it. Uh, and it's really part of the, the whole data analysis process and uh, finding those patterns. And of course, corporations have been doing data mining for uh, quite a long time now and are, are now, you know, doing things like predicting products that you'd like to purchase. Well, you just purchased this polo shirt. Wouldn't you like to purchase these 87 things that go with it? Um, so nonprofits, uh, of course, in the last few years have been moving into this as well um, to define affinity scores, um, protect propensity for giving to organization, targeting direct mail response, uh, and also enhancing donor retention and other less um, traditional method, traditional um, uses for that data. Okay, so um, with that, I'm going to pass it over first to Sean Vincent. Thank you, Jill. Um, first, let me apologize. I managed to get the head cold that I think half the people seem to be passing around. Um, so I'll try not to sniffle in the middle of the presentation. <laughs> um, when we talked about alumni participation at Puget Sound, um, we knew lots of other people were already doing it. Um, and so we wanted to find a, a process that we felt would work well for us. Um, I, I listened to the, the Michigan State example yesterday, and I don't have 65 people working for me. Um, I, there's basically myself, a report writer, uh, and my data entry team. So um, what I'm going to share is a slightly smaller uh, approach, uh, but, but uh, certainly what, what we feel is going to be a, a very helpful tool for us. So um, again, my name is Sean Vincent. I'm from the University of Puget Sound. We're just 30 or so miles down the road in Tacoma, Washington. Um, if you read the little bio in the newspaper, um, I've enjoyed being the them in every conversation at every one of these conferences I go to because I'm a former director of annual giving, a former major gift officer. I complained too much about the data and got the job I have now, um, trying to make it work for everybody and, and uh, now trying to make the reporting and all the tools be exactly what the development staff need and the alumni staff need and, and everyone else. Um, so alumni attachment, is not this. Um, this is a, actually a shot of uh, one of our students who's now an alum uh, and one of our faculty members who's also an alum uh, at the University of Puget Sound out in front of our student union building. Um, we, we'd love to have our alums closely attached to us, but probably not du duct taped to the, the columns out in front of our, our student union building. Uh, alumni attachment for us uh, is basically who are the alums that are closest to us now and ideally, we should already know all those individuals. Um, but who are the people the next tier down? Um, and we, want, we set out to build a tool that would allow us to, to tell exactly that information. So when we, when we started out the project, we wanted to um, start by talking with other institutions. Um, we didn't feel like we needed to reinvent the wheel here. here. Uh, one of the 
reasons we're all coming to Drive and, and go to other similar conferences is we're not really competing directly with one another, so there's many opportunities to seek out information and, and assistance from our fellow colleagues and, and get a better idea for what's worked, what's not worked. Um, so we had those exact conversations. We actually stole some, some great things from some of the others that we spoke with. Um, and then we knew that we needed to make sure that the approach we used for the university would fit with our history and, and be broad enough to really uh, work well for us. So um, we did the analysis. We, we looked at the data we already had. Um, and we quickly realized we basically needed to break this into a couple of phases. The first phase was, what do we have now? What's the data that already exists that we could start to build a score on? Um, and the second phase is, the next pieces that we'd like to be able to track. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So um, again, we needed to take our history into account at the university. Um, Puget Sound has changed a lot over the years. Um, we were a little bit of a commuter school uh, and sort of the local school. If you lived in certain zip codes, you tend to go to University of Puget Sound. And if you lived in other zip codes, you went to Pacific Lutheran. And other ones, you went to University of Washington. Um, and that's changed over the last 20 to 30 years. And now we are very much a, a a residential liberal arts college. Well, you can't have the same approach to your alums who have very different experiences at your institution. Um, and you also need to make sure that you're paying attention to what those things were that, that were indicators of involvement and attachment um, in the 50s and 60s versus what they were in the 2000s, because they're very different. So our tool attempts to be both broad and flexible uh, and allows us to do that. Um, and Again, we want to we want to make sure that we're identifying those those key participants that are already close to the institution and find that next tier down. So we broke our score into five sub scores, um, and and um, this is one of those things that we uh, borrowed directly from a couple of other institutions. Um, I think even some of the names we actually decided to use the exact same names. Um, uh, University of uh, Wisconsin at Madison is, is another millennium site um, and had some of these same things that they'd already blazed the trail for us. So we were like, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. Let's do that. Um, for alumni engagement, we wanted to look at uh, a, a breadth of factors. We wanted to pay attention to um, were they a past volunteer for us? And again, we have volunteer information going back to the, the 50s and 60s. Um, Unfortunately, not before that, but we have it at least that far back. Um, but volunteerism then looked a lot different than it does now. Then it was, you know, I let you put my name on a letter that, that we typed. <laughs> um, and we've got the carbons to prove it. It's great. Um, and then, um, you know, are they attending regional events? Are they coming to campus? Are they taking that extra step to, to travel to the university? Um, What's their, what's their alumni involvement look like? So we basically scored a whole series of factors uh, that we use to identify alumni attachment, both in the past and uh, current volunteers. Uh, then for giving, we didn't want to use the traditional alumni participation calculation, um, the one that we all know and love so very much, um, how many are giving uh, and how many do you have good addresses for? But at the same time, we didn't want to discount financial support. So we sought to, to build a tool that would allow us to equally weigh giving with the other five, uh, the other four subcategories that we have. So we chose to increase the, the weighted score for those who have higher years of consecutive giving or higher levels of giving to the institution. Um, we also wanted to make sure we were paying attention to those uh, using a prior tool we developed that had higher inclinations as planned giving prospects. Um, and you know, what's their consistent history in, in giving to the institution? So we wanted to take all those things into account. We also, uh, frankly, wanted to, to give some additional weight to those who were willing to meet with our, our contact staff. So for each contact report that's been filed in the last five years, um, they get an additional point. So if you're always dodging the calls from our development officers, you're not going to get as many points. Um, whereas if you're willing to meet with them and let them talk with you about the current initiatives at the, at the university and, and some of the things we're working on, you'll, you'll increase your score. Um, it was really somewhat entertaining when we shared this information with our alumni council and with our board of trustees because they immediately started to get a little bit of competition going on. They're like, well, so, so what do I need to do to get my score higher? Um, you know, we, we didn't release that bit to them, but uh, it was entertaining to watch. Um, and then when we were developing the score, uh, we wanted to get a good idea from uh, cross sections of our alums what it was that 
sort of drove them to, to be engaged with the institution in the first place. Um, so we talked to just a select number of alums, but those who were pretty deeply engaged across a variety of decades. And um, time and time again, as we sort of expected, but, but the conversations bored out, those who were involved more deeply as students tended to be more deeply involved as alums. Um, not exclusively, but um, it was a pretty strong indicator. So we wanted to make sure we used the data that we already had. Um, when we went to our, our current database system, Millennium, um, 12 years ago, we had the ability finally to track a lot of affinity data that we just couldn't do with our prior system. So we actually, for a couple of years, uh, using student staff and, and my biorecord staff, we literally mined our alumni um, yearbooks. And we put in all the participants in student government and sports teams and clubs and uh, a whole breadth of things. Um, and then also as we've been going through a, a database conversion for our student system, I've been grabbing every bit of data I possibly can before it gets lost or muddled uh, in, the, in that conversion that we're working through. Uh, and again, made sure we had all the honors and awards and everything else that I possibly could get my hands on and, and, and associated that with each one of our alums. So we took all this data together um, and we wanted to look then at, at the demographic information, but we didn't want to look at it um, just that we had a phone number or an address for them. I mean, we're constantly going out and trying to find our, our lost alums and keep track of what our alums are up to. So we sought to instead base our, our weighing scores, our, uh, our factors on those that were being proactive. So were they providing the data to us? Um, and this led to a little bit of a change in our, our business processes actually because what we had been doing just prior to this project was if a contact staff member went out and visited with an alum and got a new job title and a new phone number, for example, when they were on the visit, they'd come back and do their contact report and we would attribute that, the source of that data, to the development officer, when really the development officer was just passing the information through. So we had to sort of retrain ourselves and retrain our contact staff, which is what took a little longer, um, to get used to identifying the source of that as being directly from the alum or maybe it's from a business card or you know, however they obtained it. Um, there's other times when the contact staff just in the process of trying to get the appointment will do their own search and, and find it and we even started attributing those sources of information. So by making those subtle changes, we were actually able to apply scores to those who were providing directly the information to us. Also, if they responded to our annual alumni survey for those that are in a reunion year, they obviously got points for that. Um, and even other things, like did they submit a class note to the alumni magazine so that they were letting both the institution and their fellow alums know what they're up to. I got this great new promotion, I have a child, things like that. So we put that all together and, and this is a, a shot of what the, the summary rows of the, the spreadsheet looks like. It's a gigantic spreadsheet um, and I try not to provided to too many people because it, it's huge. Um, but the summary data is really what's most important. And, and the further we got into this process and the, and the more we were refining it as we were doing the building process, um, the, the clearer it became to us that, that the sub-component scores are gonna be just as important and just as valuable to the, the contact staff as the total score. As we were building it, we went through and, and we sorted by each of those subcategories and we looked at who fell into the list and we also looked at who's not there that, that we felt should be and then dug down and found where they were on the list and then sort of went back. It, it took six or seven passes at, at this whole process to determine exactly how were we weighing the data and what made the most sense. Uh, when we first ran it, we were clearly weighing event attendance far too heavily. Um, so anybody who lived close by and was retired and came to campus a lot suddenly spiked up to the top of the, the list and, and it was a, an incorrect indicator. Um, so after we did those pass-throughs and we adjusted some of those weighing factors, we came out with what really feels like the, the right score for us at this point. Um, and this is fairly new. We don't have, we only have the one score that we've done so far and, and are just starting to use. So I I'm, apologize, I don't have historical data to, to point to to say how well it's gone. Um, but it did do exactly what we wanted in that we can see who are our most engaged, most attached alums at this point. And what we felt is much more valuable is that next tier down. As we're going out and trying to do recruitment for reunion volunteers or for class agents or solicitations for the capital giving staff and they're trying to identify which of the half of their prospect pool that are all in an assessment stage should they go talk to first, 
those staff members are able to look at that overall score and see, oh, well, okay, these people are both in assessment, but this one's a 22 and this one's a four. I should probably start with the one that's a 22 because based on the other statistical data we have, that person's more likely to be warm to my call and be, be open to a, to a visit. Um, we also, uh, as I mentioned, the, the sub-scores become more important because naturally the, the alumni staff are a little more interested in the alumni engagement or the um, student engagement sub-scores than they are perhaps the giving scores. Not exclusively, but they tend to lean that way a little bit. Same thing, the development officers are a little more interested in the giving and prospect management scores. And that, that prospect management score especially, it helps them when they're perhaps already in a region visiting and, and they have a cancellation and they're trying to sort of fill in a hole in their schedule. They can quickly contact us and we can help them identify the prospects that are in that area, um, both either my office or our research office and help them out. So I just wanna highlight some examples from uh, one of our uh, alumnas um, here. This is actually what it looks like in our Millennium Database system. So as I said, we, we went ahead and included the data. It's at the bottom, so if you're in the back, I hope you can see that. Um, but we actually uh, wanted to make it readily available for all the contact staff, all the staff, if they needed to see it. Um, and just gives you a good feel for um, what we're doing with the data. We're planning at this point to uh, update it twice a year, so it's not gonna be too frequently updated because we want to be able to see changes over time. Um, uh, there's some uh, on campus who are wondering if maybe we should just update it once a year, but at this point the plan is to update it twice a year, um, and this is still fairly new for us. So just gives you a, a couple examples again of, of uh, where the data sits. And uh, there, are, there are a number of factors that can, that can change for people. We've got in, in phase one here, we've got 63 different factors that we're using. Um, phase two, we're planning on adding at least 14 more. I'm sure that number is going to jump up uh, because there's some things that we don't yet track in the database or, but are starting to uh, devise a way to do so, like who are all the alums that are linked to our LinkedIn page? Who are the people that are liking us on Facebook? Uh, who are our tw Twitter, Twitter followers? Sorry. Um, so a lot of those social media pieces we don't yet have the ability to track, but we want to start adding those in. Um, so. In essence, our, our primary goal here, as I said, is just to be a little bit more efficient with the way we are engaging our alums, uh, to be more targeted and, and really try and recruit those who are most interested in having a connection with the institution based on the data that we have. Um, we also know that we're gonna be able to make better choices uh, with the limited staff resources that we have. Um, we're gonna be able to target those volunteer recruitment efforts uh, class agents are going to be able to better target who we're having them ask for support of the institution. Those capital giving staff, as I've already mentioned a couple times, are going to be able to, to spend their time more wisely, uh, and hopefully we'll see a, an improvement in the, the number of calls they have to make before they get those appointments. Uh, we track all that fund data as well. Um, and you know, as, as budgets get tighter and we have to make resource decisions, if we need to cut back on some solicitation efforts, we're going to cut back on those alums who are the least likely based on the, the data we have to support the institution. Um, something I didn't mention, we actually do have a couple of instances where we have a negative score. So if you've asked that the university never contact you, you get a minus two. Um, and there's, there's a couple other cases where you can get a negative score. So there are a, there's a segment of our population that are at like minus four on their overall score. Um, and we're still gonna reach out to those people, we're still gonna try to engage them, but not as often and not as aggressively. Are there any questions? Yes. So I really like the idea of but have you found any correlation between We have. Uh, the question was if we have we seen a correlation between the scores we have and historical giving data. So when we were creating the score especially doing the, the giving segment score. Um, that was one of the things, uh, when we first ran it, we were like, wait a minute, this is, you know, one of our, one of our most generous supporters was like way down on page four. Um, and that didn't quite feel right. So we, we looked more closely at the, the weighing factors we were using um, and adjusted them a little bit. That's when we, we realized we'd been putting too much emphasis on in their engagement activities or their involvement in, current involvement and not enough on 
were they a, a longtime supporter? Uh, and again, we, we then increased the weighing factor as lifetime giving went up, and we had another one that increased as years of giving went up. Any other questions I can answer? Okay. Nancy. All right, well, I have to <clears throat> stand up. How do I do this? It should be that one. Okay, so um, I'm Nancy Penner, and I am uh, from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, almost two years ago, um, our new president at the institution um, launched a new program that was um, very significant, and it's called our, our Moonshots program, and basically, um, the faculty, the researchers, the, everybody at the institution were, were focusing on um, eight specific cancer diseases, um, looking at how we can change where a clinical discovery in the lab takes typically 10 years before there's any kind of real tangible treatment to um, any of us that might be suffering from those diseases. So it's not only looking at the specific diseases and the, and the, what we know about um, those cancer problems already, but it's the whole <clears throat> excuse me, process to really do something about this. And um, it's a very bold um, initiative, and I'm sure you can all um, infer that it's going to take money to get these programs off the ground and do the work that we need to do to truly solve the cancer problem, which is our mission at MD Anderson, which is to make cancer history. Um, so, big initiative, institution-wide. This is all about the clinical and research staff, right? Well, no. The development office uh, plays a role in this because, again, we've, we're tasked with uh, raising a lot of funds to not only uh, get these programs going, but also to put the dollars in place to really see these initiatives through. So we had never really um, done disease-focused fundraising before. So this was a new challenge for uh, the development office as an organization and also for the work that I participate in to help identify prospects, who are the best prospects, who are the best individuals to be handing off to these uh, major gift officers to be um, going after and aligning the interest of the donor to the interest of the institution. So um, we had a challenge. And about almost a year and a half ago, we started kind of thinking about that. HIPAA actually uh, helped us. There was a change in the HIPAA laws uh, that went into effect in September um, that allowed us as an organization to now know a patient's um, doctor and clinical service. And whereas before we had to get a specific HIPAA authorization from that individual if that said, as a development office, we're allowed to see that information. So this opened up um, the whole patient base to us um, to be able to learn about their physician and service. Now, we're a cancer hospital, and there's a team approach to what we do, and there's a lot of doctors, and there's a lot of different departments that provide service. So we had to really evaluate um, kind of what we want to lock into. And I try to um, apply this tenet, keep it simple. So we, we decided to, to grab that first uh, registration appointment. Um, as a cancer hospital, we're treating the person, you know, when they first come in in, in an ongoing kind of long-term way, as opposed to a acute care hospital where you might come in one day to have a baby and another day to have your, you know, uh, your kids' tonsils come out, it, different things. So while a patient can, in fact, experience multiple types of cancer in their lifetime, um, we decided, well, let's, let's grab one. So we were able to do that. 
Um, the other thing I mentioned is we had to literally reorganize as a development office in the fundraising organization. We had been um, organized geographically where each uh, field officer had a particular territory that they traveled to um, to meet with major gift uh, prospect donors. Um, so while we still have that team, we also have a transformational initiatives team now. So these folks are principally focused on these, this Moonshot fundraising initiatives. Um, they're looking at a, a few other like different ways of going about corporate um, and foundation uh, major gifts type of work. And then we have a, a third team, not Moonshot related, but um, at the same time we're expanding our plan giving uh, plans. So we went from kind of one field staff that you could pretty easily, when you saw a new lead, um, and our research team is looking at those people and looking at the best people, oh, they live in Chicago, they have a capacity of X, we can um, put them in the portfolio of this field officer and have them do that you know, qualification work. It's not so simple anymore. So um, we had to think about how can we segment our population. Um, to go back to Jill's analogy with uh, uh, mineral mining, uh, I, I would kind of say we did a little alchemy. Um, we, we took some of the data that we already have and we added attributes to it to kind of turn it into something more than, than what it was. Uh, um, so we have giving, we have NOSA data, we have a concept of an interest attribute. We do get physician referrals. Um, we uh, absorb a lot of obituary information. As you can imagine, we do a pretty high volume of uh, in-memory um, gift transactions. And um, the contact reports from our field officers as well as um, the patient information. So we did some data transformation on the chart of accounts. We literally went through the, I don't know, six, seven, eight thousand different funds that we've had on file over the history um, of the data that we have um, and looked at who is the primary signature authority. Is that a physician? Is that a, in, in what department are they associated? Is this a fund specific to a particular research that's specific to prostate cancer? Is this a specific research related to some kind of chronic lymphocytic leukemia? We took whatever we could you know, nudge out of the data and added another um, attribute to that to say this fund is associated with this moonshot disease. Now, not every fund has a tag. It took a while, it was a manual process. And obviously, we have funds that get created every day, so there's an ongoing way for us to kind of tag that. So that allows us to associate a gift to potentially a moonshot um, disease area. The NOSA data, anybody else use NOSA data? Y'all know what NOSA data is? Okay, so NOSA is a data service uh, provided by Target Analytics, BlackBot company. And it's basically, I could be, anyone from BlackBot wants to correct me, please do. Um, collecting donor honor roll data from nonprofits across the country. And basically it's, it's allowing me to know that Nancy Penner gave a gift to the American Cancer Society or to you know PETA or whatever. So all these uh, nonprofit giving, and, and what you get back is, um, if it matches to your, your data, um, you know that someone made a gift to this recipient, and there's a categorization on that recipient. So a, um, the American, what's my example, Leukemia Society has a standard recipient category of healthcare. Well, we, looked at all of those and um, in the jobs that we use to take that data and import it into our database, we've got some um, ancillary tables that allows us to change healthcare to leukemia or prostate or one of those more specific areas so we can be a little more 
uh, focused on some of that. So that's another indicator we're using. The interest attribute was our way to, if the donor, if the um, prospect had said, you know, I am interested in helping um, this solve this problem or help this doctor with their research kind of thing. That was something that we'd collected. And again, we were able to uh, identify which one of those are part of our Moonshot programs. Um, the physician referral, uh, we do have a program where we try to train our doctors and nurses to listen to clues. Um, when they're uh, talking to patients, uh, a patient might say, you know, what can I do to help? Something that uh, vague. They're trained to um, diplomatically hand them over to the development office so as not to get caught up in between that, oh, you're going to give us money, I'm going to treat you special kind of thing. So we have a routine way to try to uh, take in physician referrals um, and obviously know which doctor that is. And again, we're going to make an assumption about the interest of the patient that was referred by that doctor. I mentioned the death, uh, the obituary information, and the contact reports. Uh, we are doing um, some natural language analytics, some text analytics to try to pick up keywords out of those big text blogs that we have in our database. Um, it's very common, you know, in lieu of flowers, please um, make gifts to X. You can infer a lot from that. You can also infer relationships of a surviving family and find out who those people are. Um, and as well as, you know, often it's, you know, the so-and-so died peacefully after a long battle with, you know, cancer XYZ. So we're, we're doing that and we're trying to pull that um, forward as discrete data uh, to help us with a cancer experience type of attribute. Um, and then the patient information. So we pull in all of our patient data twice a month, all of the new patients that are registered. And uh, while we don't store in our database their doctor or their department of service, we do uh, have views into um, the patient systems and the uh, patient warehouse systems that allow us to pull that in for reporting and analytic purposes. So we can now know, like I said, the, um, the physician and department. Um, we also do a lot of work to try to associate family relationships, especially around our patient base. While a small percentage of our gifts come from the patient or patient family population, the vast majority of our dollars come from the patient, patient family population. So um, it's an important segment for us. And if you can know the extended family and you can know that this prospect's Uncle Steve died of you know, prostate cancer and he was that special uncle, again, is, is there some little affinity to, to that? And that's what we're trying to grasp at. Um, so that was the nature of the data. And then we um, used a tool, our uh, data visualization and analytics tool that we're actually just pretty newbies at and we're getting um, to learn more. Uh, we use a tool uh, from ClickView, called ClickView. So we're, we pulled together the people that um, may be associated with these moonshot areas. Um, and in addition, we pulled all the other data that we have. You know, what is their uh, probability of being a major gift donor or planned gift donor, or what's their capacity, all that other stuff that we've been using for, for some time to identify the best prospects in our pool. Um, and then we've also got that geography that we can overlay. So this is, um, this is just the information page off of our, our Moonshot Prospect dashboard. And I show it here because it kind of, uh, again, summarizes the membership classifications. And I have to look close here. So the donor membership is based on if they made a gift to one of those funds that's tag tagged. Are they a living patient associated to one of these diseases? Do they have a living patient family member relationship? Do they have a surviving family member relationship? Um, 
and the faculty referral, the external donor, that's that NOSA information. And um, again, we're kind of going to associate them to membership classes. So I hope you can see this. But this is just a kind of a quick um, snapshot at the data that we're providing. So we have selected um, unassigned prospects that may have some membership class to CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, okay? And with, you can, you know, filter through and, and click through down to uh, additional detail, but it, we're seeing that from a kind of a campaign and a pyramid perspective, you know, are there enough aggregate prospects out there at the seven-figure range to be able to bring in this money that we've been asked to do. So that was one of the first things, is do we have the pyramids out there, the, the depth of people that we can go out and uh, see if we're going to be able to meet that target goal that's just been given to us. We're trying to substantiate that what the goals might be, should be, what's reasonable. Um, so you get a household count, you get an individual count. Um, so this is, you know, just the high level. We're looking at counts um, at a capacity level. We can see where they live. Within the state of Texas, we drill down into a much finer grain to see where those uh, constituents might be. Um, and we can also see the actual names of people that um, might qualify. And if you see um, that membership, that second column there, you can kind of see that they qualified based on one membership class or a combination of membership classes. So that's kind of what we've done to try to, again, pull together something that we hadn't been able to pull together before. So um, this has been well received by our transformational initiatives team. And of course, they want us to do the next step, which is like, you know, give me the pipeline, give me the, you know, the donors and all of that. And in fact, we're working on, uh, on that now. So this was more of a counts and, and, and viability type of um, information. And now they really want to be able to see, OK, let's get the research team involved and hand these people off. And how can we triage now out to three kind of different teams um, our, our lead pipeline? So um, the nice thing about data and um, data display and things that can, again, uh, show you answers to things, my mind is that, you know, you get a taste of it and then they want more and they want more and they want more. So I think that's a good thing. Um, um, so uh, the things that we're doing next beyond the uh, pipeline work, we want to uh, do more work on that natural language uh, analytics. Um, the institution is doing a lot of work um, along that line. In fact, they're using uh, IBM Watson. Uh, for this moonshot work to be able to look at uh, the textual data that's in our clinical records and see what kind of information that they can glean from that. And we are tapping into those brilliant people that are working on those algorithms and some of that work. There's some uh, uh, commercially available tools that we're using and also there's a, there's a physician scientist on staff that's actually <coughs> building his own kind of routine. So we're trying to, again, use um, the power of their work and, and steal it where we can so we can, uh, again, help with this whole Moonshot program the way we've been asked to do it, which is to with philanthropic funds. So, questions? Yes? We have done some very basic uh, SQL queries. That's how we started and pointed it against our uh, contact report text blobs, our death row comment <laughs> text blobs where we'll cut and paste um, obit stuff. And I wish I could tell you the name of the uh, commercially available program that we're working in, and it, it's escaping me. So um, I'm sorry, I don't know. You know we're, we're trying to kind of get in line with uh, those other groups to, uh, to allow them to help us with that. So we can get a lot smarter in this area. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate it.
Let's have lunch. Mm -hmm. <laughs>